Okay. And let me share my screen. And can you all see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to teach on something that um, I got to just tell you, I love this teaching. I've taught it a, a number of times and um, probably because it applies to me more than anybody else. And because I've learned so much, um, so many had many, so many insights, but I call it the five fools of Proverbs and I subtitle it. What kind of fool am I? Because um, when we go into the book of Proverbs, there's clearly a number of themes. You know, one of them is, you know, fearing God. The beginning of knowledge starts with the fear of God. It also has the uh, themes of the righteous versus the wicked. And we also have good versus evil, proud versus humble, the diligent versus the sluggard. Um, but I think one of the dominant themes in there, besides the righteous and the wicked, is the wise and the fool. After all, Proverbs is a book on wisdom. And when we think about foolish people, God has a lot to say about foolish people. Um, here's just a few verses, you know, Proverbs 12, 15, the way of the fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. I mean, how many times have I fallen into that position myself where I know I'm right, I know I'm certain. Just the other day at work, my brother said something, I go, no, that's not the way it was. And then I went, I looked, I went, oops you know, foot and mouth syndrome, and uh, I was wrong. And so, the, you know, clearly the way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 29, 9, if a wise man goes to court with a fool, the fool rages and scoffs and there's no peace. And Proverbs 10, 23, a fool finds pleasure in evil conduct, but a man of understanding delights in wisdom. So I can go on and read the rest of these. They're here in the teaching. But my point in this is God's got a lot to say about fools. And what I have found years ago, reading a book, I, I realized that not all fools are the same. Um, when we speak in the English language, um, you know, we'll use the word for fool. But I'm reminded of years ago, I heard um, Native um, American Indians for instance, had something like 30 different words for rain. And Eskimos have something similar to that for snow and ice. And you're like, why? Well, because the Eskimo, you know, the Native Americans up in the northern regions, their whole world is a world of ice and snow. So in just like the Native Americans with rain, there's a mist, there's a heavy rain, there's a light rain, there's a driving rain. And they would have different words. The problem when we have in English is we say fool and we think of the jester uh, or just uh, someone who's stumbling over themselves. But actually, um, these descriptions that, that I've got here, um, I think pretty much characterize the various Hebrew words that are in Proverbs that are translated as fool or a relationship to fool. So the first one is a simple fool. Now, you wonder, what are all these pictures of animals on here, Dan? Well, the simple fool, I equate to sheep. And as we go through your teach, this teaching, um, I think you'll see why. And for me, this helps visually to understand these. The unreasonable fool is like a heifer. A heifer is a young female cow. Um, can be kind of stubborn, lots of times knows what to do, but just won't do it. You got to really push them. They can be unreasonable at times. Then there's also a stubborn fool, different Hebrew word that we'll see. And that's like a donkey, a mule, you know, mule headed, hard headed, stubborn as a mule, stubborn as a donkey. And then there's the mocking fool. That's a whole different category of foolishness. And there's also a trajectory of evil that will be seen that is described in these levels of foolishness. Once a person gets to the point of being a mocking fool, it's a very serious evil place to be. And then the last category is the committed fool. And a committed fool, for lacking any better picture, I equate it with a lemming. 
You know, they're so committed into it. They just follow one another right into suicide. They're, they're, they've gone beyond stubbornness and they're totally committed to this. So the simple fool is the very first category. And I remember I said, now this is like a sheep. And I remember a couple of teachings ago, I equated a simple fool. I'll give you an example. But Proverbs 7, 7 of the uh, ESV says, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the use, a young man lacking sense. Remember a few weeks ago, I taught on Proverbs 7 and the and the trajectory of evil that, that God, uh, you know, describes in that. Well, this is the Hebrew word, Strong's number 6612. And um, I am not a Hebrew scholar like my sister Suzanne, but uh, for lack of a better way, I'll pronounce it pethe and um, English spelling P-I-T-H-Y. And it, it literally is just naive, simple, simple foolishness, unknowing. Um, it can be described as open and unguarded in a mental and moral sense, They're easily persuaded by flattery, delusion, deception, enticement. They lack foresight. In other words, they, they lack the ability to see the consequences to their actions. And the best way to think of this is just like a little kid. Um, the example I think of is years ago, I lived in Indiana. I had a grandson who was three years old. I think I told this example once. He stepped out of my car onto asphalt, which was blazing hot, barefooted. And before I could grab him, he's screaming and he just kept running down the asphalt as I'm trying to grab him. We eventually caught him. Blisters happened on the feet, bandage. He, he just didn't know. He was simple minded. And that's the very first category of, of a fool. And that's what God says. I've seen among the simple. It could be translated. I've seen among the fools. I've perceived among the use a young man lacking sense. So here's a couple more examples. Uh, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Proverbs 1 is, you know, what's the purpose of Proverbs? Well, to give prudence, to give instruction to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. And I've seen among the simple, Proverbs 7, 7, and perceived among the youth a man lacking sense. We've already read that one. And 9, 16, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, the she there is wisdom personified. So my point is that, that when God talks of fools in Proverbs, not all these fools are the same. So clearly, if you're a simple fool, then, then the simple believes anything. Well, why? Because they're ignorant. They're naive. They don't know. Um, and then in 22.3, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer. Because see, that type of a fool cannot um, see the consequences. So I like to think of this as, in some ways, we are all simple fools, because there are things that I just don't know anything about. Um, I, 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 you would never want me to be your neurosurgeon, because I had no knowledge of medicine. I'm a simple fool in that sense. I'm not, I'm not instructed. So to some degrees, I'm a simple fool when it comes to auto mechanics. I know enough to change a battery and to change a tire and to check my oil and to do some things. But nowadays with cars, the minute that little light comes on, we call that the idiot light, the check engine light. I'm the simple fool who has to go to the auto parts store or to a dealership and say, run the diagnostic code and, and figure out what that means and please help fix my car because I'm a simple fool. So what's the antidote to a simple fool? And before I go into this, I just want to say, we can't treat all fools the same. That's one of the points of this teaching. If you're dealing with a simple fool, or if I'm being a simple fool, then the antidote, the solution to being a simple fool is instruction. And you do that through teaching, discipline, and example. So God says in Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise, uh, making the simple wise, I believe it should be. I, mi I probably mistyped that. But the point is that even when we, we all know there are some people who come to Christ, don't know anything about the Bible. And in that regard, they're a simple fool. And it's not a bad thing. They just don't know. So in this case, then the answer is 
instruction. The testimony of the Lord is sure because they need that. They need to understand it. Proverbs 19, 25, like a scoffer and the simple or strike a scoffer and the simple will learn prudence. Another word for wisdom. So here God is telling us, okay, a scoffer is not a simple fool. A scoffer is a whole different category. So strike a scoffer. In other words, you discipline the scoffer and what's going to be one of the things that results? The simple will see it and they'll learn. So see, simple fools, the answer, the antidote is instruction, is teaching, is discipline. And here, Proverbs 19, 25, God tells us it's examples. When a, In 21, 11, when a scoffer is punished, the simple become wise. So that, that's the point is there have been many times in counseling. Someone has come to me over the years. We discern the problem. What's the issue? And immediately, if I discern that this person is merely a simple fool, then I know, okay, the answer is we need instruction, I need examples, and I need to be able to, to help them and to show them. So the next category of a fool is an unreasonable fool. Now, I've, I've, I've chosen this bright yellow, I'm colorblind, I think it's yellow, a uh, bright yellow background. And the reason is the simple fool was simple blue it's easy right the unreasonable fool this is kind of like whoa caution there's we're getting a little we're, we're, remember i said that in the beginning that one of the themes in proverbs is righteousness and wickedness well foolishness many times is equated to wickedness and there's and as we go down this this trajectory of foolishness we increase in wickedness um so this is just the unreasonable fool the heifer knows what to do. Female yearling cows are stubborn beasts. And you can you got to push them, you got to prod them. And that's what Proverbs says is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is not the simple fool. This is the Hebrew word, Strong's number 6612, and it's a bell. Uh, and this means one who despises wisdom doing what is right, one who is licentious. Now, the best way that I can think of an unreasonable fool is it's kind of like, I know, I'm, I, know I shouldn't lie, but I'm gonna. I know I shouldn't steal, but I'm going to. See, I know what I should do. So the problem is not I'm simple, I don't know. The problem is I do know, but I'm being unreasonable in the sense of, I am choosing not to do it. And think of a child. So many times children, they know what to do. They know they need to make their bed. They just don't do it. So this is the type of foolishness, as I say, knows what they should do, but they just won't do it. An example of this is a lot of times a spoiled brat, a rebellious person, you know, re rebellious. It's like, you know what to do. You're just not going to do it. And uh, Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes but a wise man listens to advice. See, it's unreasonable. I'm right in my own eyes. I don't care what, what God says. I don't care that God told me not to do that. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be unreasonable. In Proverbs 14, 9, by the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back. It's like, ooh, wait a minute. This is a lot different than instruction. This is a lot different than than them seeing the scoffer, see the scoffers being struck, the, the scoffer is getting a rod, but the simple learn from it. So that's another point is many times, if you don't instruct and do the right thing to, to an unreasonable fool, then all the, they're an example for all the other people around them too. Proverbs 20, verse three, it is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quick to quarreling again. This is the unreasonable fool. And in uh, 20, 24, 7, wisdom is, who, is too high for a fool. So uh, other verses are a fool, Proverbs 24, 7, a fool despises his father's instruction, right? He knows what to do. He's just not going to do it. Stone is heavy, sand is weighty, but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. Proverbs, that's 27, 3. And 27, 22, crush a fool in a mortar with a pestle, along with crushed grain, yet his folly will not depart from him. Why won't his folly depart from him? 
because he's choosing to keep it. He's choosing to do what's wrong. He knows what's right. He's just not going to do it. This kind of fool, which we have all been, and in, I will say, even to this day, there's times where I know I should do something and I don't do it. When that happens, I'm an unreasonable fool, according to God's definition. And uh, reasonable fools lack self-discipline, control. Uh, they generally have an unsettled in their life in maybe one area or something. It's illogical and it's like excessive anger can, can accompany unreasonable foolishness. Um, and unreasonable fools belittle the dangers of sinful behavior, not to others, but in their mind. It's like, yeah, I know I'm, I know I'm supposed to do that, but I'm not going to do it. I, and uh, in, in their own mind, and you'll see in a minute why I say in their own mind. So the antidote to an unreasonable fool is God tells us they have to be disciplined. You've got to define and establish strong limits and boundaries with an unreasonable fool. Now, I know in my own life, applying it to myself, if I have an area of my life that I've been unreasonable in, and uh, let, let's just say I'm drinking too much. I'm not, but let's say I am. And um, then it would then I need to for myself to find strong limits and boundaries. Or if I have someone that I'm responsible for, I need to do it for them. But if it were in my own case, um, then my my strong limits and boundaries would be I will not permit any alcohol in my house because I don't have the discipline to overcome my unreasonable behavior in my mind. And so Proverbs 14, three says, by the mouth of a fool comes a rod for the back. Now this is a lot different than simple instruction. This is a rod is, a, it's a sense of, the rod was not beating, but it was that, that snapping. It was like getting the attention. And that's what has to happen to the unreasonable fool and in myself when I have, when I'm being an unreasonable fool, you've got to get that fool's attention. You've got to say, whoa, and, and it has to be a very strong boundary. Proverbs 27, 20 verse seven says, a rod is for the back who, of him who lacks sense, who lacks judgment. It's not that they don't know what they should do. They're lacking judgment, lacking the sense of doing it. And that's a rod, that's a sharper, uh, type of discipline and 20 verse 15 22 15 folly is bound up in the heart of a child but the rod of discipline drives it far from him this would be a complete misapplication of god's word if i took a rod to a simple fool i i i'm sure you can understand that a simple fool someone who doesn't know they don't need a rod or they don't need strong boundaries they need instruction now I've discerned, hey, this person knows what they should do, and they're just not doing it. I've had situations in church settings where I've been responsible in leadership, and I've had people that I need to discipline, and I have to establish very strong boundaries with them. And, you know, and it's kind of like, well, I know they're not the next category of foolishness, which we're going to go to. I've already, they come before, I've already instructed them. I know that's not the issue. Now, okay, we're going to have to have some discipline. I may have to have them step back from a position for a while. I may have to limit what they do. But the point is, when we're dealing with an unreasonable fool, it's like the heifer. Knows what to do. It's just strong-willed, not going to do it. And so we have to start instituting some boundaries. So the next type of category is that stubborn fool. Now, I have to admit, I've been a stubborn fool, too, at times. And I think if you're honest with yourself, you probably have to. A stubborn fool is like the donkey. Um, Proverbs 10, verse 23. Doing wrong is like a joke to a fool. Well, it's not a joke to the simple fool. It's not a joke to the unreasonable fool. But this is a whole, this has taken it up a whole notch. Doing wrong is like a joke to the fool. Ah, it's no big deal. <laughs> so I drank too much. So I went out and had an affair. Oh, big deal. They'll get over it. You know, my point is, this is a whole level of increasing in, in, in the trajectory of evil. It's uh, the Hebrew word, uh, kassel, uh, Strong's number 3684. And its meaning is to be obstinately set in his rebellious ways, not moved by godly counsel. So this is the person 
They've been instructed. They know what to do. They've chosen not to do it. And this is the person who continues to not do it and not do it. They're being stubborn about it. I know, I know what I should do. I'm not going to do it anyway. And it's just in their mind. It's like, there's nothing you can do. I'm, I'm stubborn in my ways in this. This type of fool cannot cope well with legitimate authority. This is the kind of person, if you're in a congregation or if you're overseeing a company and you've got, it's like, these are the kind of people that, that stir up the, the you know what behind the scenes. They get everybody else. They, you know, well, they, you know, that person, you know, they're telling me this and that. And, they, you know, they slander under their breath. They hide their hatred. There's just a whole level of contempt that comes with a stubborn fool. And they feed on contention, rebellion, and strife. That's why I say they stir up others in their in their sinfulness, their, their uh, stubborn foolishness. Um, I have to admit, there's been times in my life when I've been a stubborn fool. You know, there was a time in my life younger, I'm going back 40 years ago, I had decided I was going to, you know, I was just going on a trajectory of sin. A good friend of mine showed up one day, came, flew in from another state, sat down, we visited for a while and we went out and we we're sitting down drinking and he's turned to me and he said, brother, I don't know what you're doing in your life, but whatever it is, you need to stop it. And I knew right then and there, it was like the cattle prod right between my eyes. God was busting me because I can hide things from a lot of people, but I can't hide from God. And he spoke to this friend of mine. He loved me enough. He flew out and he confronted me. I was on that slippery slope of sin, and it it took a strong rebuke for me to, to snap out of it. The stubborn fool, just like this man, I don't care what you have to say, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do. So in Proverbs 13, 16, every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. This is a whole new level of, of evil. Proverbs 13, 19, a desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to turn away from fool, from evil is an abomination to fools. See, I, I hope you're getting the sense here that this type of fool, when we venture into this category, this is a very serious area where we know what we should do. It's not that we just don't do it occasionally. This is an area where I do it. I'm, I'm just not doing it all the time. I, you know, I, I had a, uh, a person, a relative, who was an alcoholic and confronted about, the, they were a stubborn fool. When confronted about their behavior, they said, I don't care what you say. I like to drink and I'm not quitting. It's that, see, it's that level of stubbornness. And so they, they won't turn away from evil. Proverbs 15, 20, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son despises his mother. Um, so, you know, what do you do with a stubborn fool? You know, the simple fool we instructed, the unreasonable fool required discipline, strong discipline. So um, we'll look at that in, this, in, in on the next slide after this one, but I want to drive this one ho home. This, this, this is a serious level. Precious treasures and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. It's just like, you know, he's gonna, he's just gonna consume everything around him. Do not, 23.9, do not speak in the hearing of a fool or he will despise the good sense of your words. I mean, see, instruction is not the answer for this kind of a person. And I, I've made that mistake a lot of times in counseling too, where I'm dealing with someone who's really on a level of foolishness that I'm thinking that I could teach him and instruct him. It's like, that's not the problem. Proverbs 26, 6, whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. Again, there's a, a whole increasing level of evil here. And 26, 8, like one who binds a stone in a sling is one who gives honor to a fool. This is the kind of fool that you're not going to get to them and their foolishness it, it's, 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 it's not, it, it doesn't accomplish what it was intended to do. The antidote, major reproof, major reproof, severe consequences. 
This is the kind of person I believe Paul was talking about in Corinthians when he says, put that man out of the church. The point was not, they, they loved him so much, they needed to put him out so he would feel the severe consequences of, of being removed from the fellowship and then would, would possibly it could pierce his heart in his turn. This is the kind of person you have got to be extremely clear with. You've got to give firm guidance. There's no, you can't be mushy. It's, you've just got to be laser sharp in what you say and what you do. After explaining precise guidance and punishment, it's best to leave their presence. When you're dealing with a stubborn fool, sometimes I've seen people, it's like a black hole. They just get sucked in a circle around that and all it is is a big energy waster. This is the type of person that many times they won't hear your reproof, your rebuke, and it goes nowhere. So that's where it's best. You, you set the boundaries. I've actually had to take people, remove them from leadership, take them away, take responsibilities away. And for that, I got the wrath that came back because of what you do. But this is why you have to remove yourself from their presence. Uh, uh, Proverbs 26, three, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey and a rod for the back of fools. This is not just a rod of instruction. This is a rod of severe punishment, like a whip for the horse. And then Proverbs 14, seven, leave the presence of a fool. You don't need to leave the presence of an unreasonable fool or a simple fool. But when you're dealing with a stubborn fool, God says, leave the presence of the fool. Uh, this type of stubborn fool, self-inflicted wounds ultimately consume them. You can see from the pictures I've got below, you know, when you've got, uh, you know, people, what we're seeing in our, you know, homelessness in the cities and the drug addictions that, you know, the prostitutes that are just caught, we're dealing with stubborn fools is what we're dealing with. Now, that's the way we pierce through that many times is to love them and to, to, to do what we can. But it's not going to be, hey, brother, you shouldn't drink. You know, they're not simple fools and they're not being unreasonable. They're they're full born stubborn in this behavior. Um, this is a much more serious category of foolishness in God's eyes and in the way you have to deal with them. Um, this type of person cares little about God's opinion or advice, and they unashamedly pursue pleasures and his sinful boldness is frightening. So the next kind of fool is a mocking fool. Now, a mocking fool can be a stubborn fool, but we've added an element to this type of fool because they use their mouth and they come back at you. So I think many times, as we saw, there's the simple fool, the unreasonable fool, and the stubborn fool. But a mocking fool is the one who's stuck in their sinfulness, and then they deride you for calling them out on it. Uh, fools, Proverbs 14, 9, fools make a mock at sin. Mock is to scorn. It's, um, it's described as to make a mouth at. In other words, to speak against it, to deride, to speak arrogantly, to boast. It's the Hebrew word, um, Strong's number 3887, lutes. And um, that's the best way I can pronounce it. Hopefully that's close to the Hebrew. Um, they throw barbed insults, flippant remarks, even silent contempt. Although mocking is to use your mouth, but there can be an element of, of a silent underwriting contempt. Because again, it's a level of foolishness, uh, uh, increased in wickedness. So think of a mocking fool as the person is like, you know, you've talked to me about me, my not drinking. I've decided to drink. And um, it's because it's what I want to do. And you're an idiot for not drinking with me. Or you're an idiot. See, they, they, now they've gone to this point, And then they turn and they start attacking you with their mouth, with their words. Um, we already read 14.9, fools make a mock at sin. 14.6. The mocker, when you read in Proverbs, the, the word mocker, it's a mocking fool. It's the mocker seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge comes easily to the discerning. Um, 21, 24, the proud and arrogant man, mocker is his name. He behaves with overweening pride. 
Um, they demonstrate an elitist cavalier disdain. They're exclusive, they're obnoxious. I'm right, you're wrong. It's almost like they're just a stench in the crowd. Um, and when, when they're confronted, they will spend a ton of energy coming back and trying to, to attack you for confronting them about their behavior. It's pretty easy to identify and identify the mocker. And um, I'm sure you probably at some point can think of examples of that. But I know that um, I, I, I don't know that I've ever been, I know I've been stubborn. I know I've been simple. I know I'm still simple in many ways. I know I've been unreasonable and still am unreasonable at times in my life. And there were times where I've been stubborn about sin. I don't think I'm, I can honestly say I don't have any stubborn areas of sin in my life, but I consider that the pathological sinner, the person that's in a habitual sinful thing. But mocking fools, that's a, a whole additional la layer. And um, I probably at some point maybe was, but I've been around a lot of people that are. Um, the antidote to the mocking fool, they, they won't handle reproof. They will not handle rebuke well. Remember, I said they're going to turn around and, and attack you for your words. Proverbs 13, 1 says, a wise son heeds a father's instruction, but a mocker does not listen to rebuke. It's just that's what God says. You know, it's like uh, we never stop loving the person, but you need to withdraw from that situation because the mocker is a very evil point. They hate those who dare to confront them and, or rebuke them. Pride prevents them from seeking wise counsel or from heeding it. And uh, Proverbs 15, 12, a mocker resents correction. He will not consult the wise. It's, a, it's, a, 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 it's the fourth layer. And fortunately, we don't run into a lot of, of mockers. So, um, so what do you do with the, the mocking fool? Um, Proverbs 9, 7 says, whoever corrects a mocker invites insult. Whoever rebukes a wicked man incurs abuse. Do not rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. So again, now we're dealing with um, this, this type of person um, in your churches, in your assemblies. Uh, if you have them at work, they need to be removed. And I have seen Proverbs 22.10 happen. Drive out the mocker and out goes strife. Quarrels and insults are ended. I was in a situation in leadership one time where there was a, a person who was stuck in some habitual sin and had done everything possible and finally just had to remove the person. And all of a sudden it was like a whole layer of peace entered into, into the assembly. Um, and that's what you have to do with a mocking fool. There's no, there's no rod, there's no instruction, there's no discipline. You just have to remove them or yourself from their presence. And the last type of fool is a committed fool. Um, now this one's probably this word, Nabal, um, may bring a person back to your memory from uh, David's dealings, but it's the Hebrew word uh, Strong's 5039, Nabal, and it means foolishly wicked, impious, vile. My wife said, what's vile? This means, blah, it's just nasty evil. This is a person, a Nabal is a absolute sold out committed fool. I think of this one, the color here red is just like, and this type of a person, um, we don't run into a lot of Nabals, but there are a lot of Nabals in the wor world. Um, I think a lot of the Nabals are the people that are very evil, committed to their evil plans, committed to their way of life, committed to promoting basically the kingdom of the enemy. And um, they will infiltrate, they're often behind scenes. Um, they have regressed to the point of complete apostasy. There's no amount in warning, correction, intellectual reasoning can stop them. They're committed to evil. They make bold, grandiose statements against God. Their mouths are filled with words sponsored by evil, vain, self-centered philosophies, conduct reveals calculated plan indifference. Clearly an evil person. So my, my point is we're coming to the fifth type of fool. You can obviously see there's... A lot of different differences between these fools here. Um, the committed fool, Psalm 14.1, for the director of music uh, of David, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. And that's a verse that may be familiar to many of you, but 
That's the Nabal. See, the, the Nabal is totally opposed to the ways of God. They're complete um, apostasy. They're corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There's no one who does good. There's no. There's nothing good coming out of a Nabal. Genesis 34, 7. I'll give you a couple of examples of a Nabal here. Um, and I'm not going to go into the full story because they're obviously, um, they're very enlightening. But um, the sons of Jacob came out to the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and they were very wroth because he had wrought folly. It's a form of the word Nabal. He had wrought nebulism um, in Israel in line with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. This is describing the actions. Of, I, I forget the name of the man, but remember Jacob came with his sons and they're traveling and they stayed. And then the, the one uh, guy, the son of a uh, the tribal chieftain, fell in love with um, their sister and then ended up sleeping with her. And that was nabolic behavior. There's a lot more to that story that's, that's I think is underwritten or uh, under the scenes. Um, but that was a nabolic uh, type of behavior. In Genesis 25 for, uh, through six, it says, and the leaders of Gibeah rose up against me and surrounded the house against me by night. And there's a man recounting what had happened to him. He said, they meant to kill me and violated my concubine, and she is dead. So I took hold of my concubine and cut her in pieces, pretty grotesque scene here, and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, where they committed abomination and outrage in Israel. That word outrage is a form of the word Nabal. And so what it was such a dreadful thing that these men of Gibeah had done that, that this... Um, Israelite cut his concubine up in pieces and sent her out as such an offense. I mean, can you imagine? It's just, but anyway, it brought outrage. And as a result of that, tremendous evil was done. Um, and, you know, as they rose up. But then also we have in 2 Samuel when Amnon, uh, with the raping of his sister uh, Tamar, um, that's described as nabolic behavior. And then in Joshua 7.15, Achan sin. I think I misspelled Achan there. Achan's sin of breaking God's command is stealing the devoted goods. And then, um, then of course, well, this was what Achan did is he went in and he, and he coveted some gold and some other objects and then took them and buried them in the tent in the floor of his, of his tent. And then the next time the men went out to battle and God uh, was against them. It's because there was nabolic behavior in the assembly and it was polluting and corrupting them. And so anyway, that, they dealt with that, and that's exactly what we'll see on the next slide. And then in 1 Samuel 25, 25, down at the bottom is a picture of a man named Nabal and his wife. Remember, um, David's men and David and his men had taken care of Nabal's herds. And then when the time came at the harvest and the slaughter time, and they said, hey, you know, can you provide us a little bit of... Uh, of the harvest and take care of us here. And, and he just re rebuked David and um, David was on his way to kill Nabal. I, I just find it incredible that uh, a group of parents, father and mother would name a baby Nabal. Um, but anyway, it proved out, maybe they didn't, maybe the man just proved himself to be a Nabal. And so therefore he's known as Nabal. Um, I don't know, but I, I know that his behavior was nabolic and the result of his behavior almost brought David into sin. See, that's what Nabals do. They stir it up and they suck everybody else into their wickedness. So the antidote, what do we do for people that are Nabals? Well, God says, stay away from them. And I believe that the only way that as you look through the examples in scripture, the only way that you can deal with a Nabal is it requires divine intervention. You know, Achan's whole family was wiped out by God. When Achan stole those things and put them, God dealt with Achan. Um, when the men of Gibeah did what they did with the concubine and stuff, the tribe of Benjamin was wiped out. Um, Nabal was struck dead. And I do believe, nothing that I can prove, but I do believe that Paul, the apostle Paul, was acting as a Nabal. He was an apostate concerning the true faith, the gospel of Christ. And it took divine intervention of Jesus to appear, knocking him off his horse in Damascus for him to turn. 
So I don't think that most of us will ever have any dealings with the Nabal. Um, God may use us to intervene on his behalf in a situation, but for the most part, we don't have to deal with the committed fool. And so just as a review, um, again, the five types of fools, we have the simple fool like the sheep, just they need instruction. They don't know what to do. You just got to teach them. You got to discipline them. And the simple fool learns by example, seeing other people when he sees the unreasonable fool, <coughs> excuse me, when he sees the unreasonable fool being punished, he learns or the stubborn fool being punished, then he'll learn. Um, then we have the unreasonable fool, like the heifer, just unreasonable, know what to do, just not going to do it, or I decide I'm going to do my own thing. A stubborn fool is, I know what I'm going to do, and doggone it, I like this sin too much, and I'm just stubborn, and I'm not changing my ways. The mocking fool is stubborn, a stubborn fool, but they use their mouth to attack and come back and to tell, you know, to to you know, stir up more contention. And again, the committed fool is the Nabal. They're just totally committed like lemmings to their death. Um, so in conclusion of this, my main point in this teaching, and I will say over the years, my understanding of these types of fools has helped me because it's helped me to understand more of my own behavior and there's been times where all of a sudden I go, whoa, I'm really being unreasonable in this, aren't I? Or there may be an area where, you know, someone might be or you might be heading to an area of, of habitual sin. Well, if you're dealing with habitual sin in your life, I will uh, say that, you know, I think habitual sin, being a stubborn fool, um, you know, I used to believe once saved, always saved, but I do believe now if a person's stuck in habitual sin, committing, knowing what they should do and, and choosing to be unfaithful to Christ, it's a very, very serious thing. People always say, well, where's the line? Well, that's the wrong question. You know, that line is not for, up for me or you. The, 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 the right question is, if you got habitual sin, let's just, let's just deal with it and get it broken. Um, We've all been the unreasonable fool, uh, you know, texting while driving. I mean, who doesn't know that you shouldn't be looking at your phone? But I will admit to this day, pull up to a stoplight. There's a stop thing. I, look, I hear my phone ping. I look, oh, where's the text? I shouldn't be doing that. That's being an unreasonable fool. The guy slothful, sleeping in, lazy. A lot of times lazy, laziness, slothfulness, that's, that's being a stubborn fool. And then also we got the one at the top with the guy whispering and backbiting. And I think a lot of times the, the sins of serious whispering, backbiting, gossip and stuff that can can could can possibly involve mocking foolery. So um, in conclusion, the five fools of Proverbs. Um, and I like to ask myself, what kind of fool am I? And as I conclude here, um, I I took time in my life. I don't know if it's not very clear if you can see that but what i did is i've actually developed for myself i went down and i did a study on every one of those words and then i i, I wrote out every one of those verses the characteristics of it what is what the reproof is and then another thing that i i strongly recommend i went through my bible one time and i went through and Every kind of fool or mocking, I, if you go into uh, BLB Blue Letter Bible and you can pull it up and you can do a search on each one of those words and you can see where every, every verse where that Hebrew word is used, say for simple fool. And then I went through my Bible and every time that was the type of fool, I put an S and I knew or I just put S-I-M knowing that's a simple fool. And when it was an unreasonable fool, I put a U over it and once a stubborn fool. And I think that in doing that, taking the time and being proactive and trying to get that into my mind, I think that God has helped me to understand that, to understand it, first of all, concerning my own behavior, and second of all, in dealing with others and counseling. So I'd just like to conclude and say, um, you know, this has been a teaching on the five fools of Proverbs, but this is a presentation by um, our organization, Allegiance to the King. And you can find us at a2kchurch.org. Um, if you are seeking fellowship, if you're alone out there and you'd like to connect with others and 
every one of us that's been on this call, that's how we found each other. And um, we're seeking to establish fellowships and churches in various areas. And so reach out and connect to us because we may have someone right around the corner from you. And if we do, I'm sure that uh, we would love to meet you. And I know that uh, you'd enjoy and be blessed to meet us too. Um, so thank you for this. It's a, this is our midweek Bible study, Wednesday nights. And uh, we also offer fellowship on Sunday mornings. And then there's also other fellowships during the week. But connect to us and you'll find all of the various resources we have. So God bless you and thank you. Um, that's the conclusion of this teaching. I'm going to return now to our gallery. And... I messed up somehow, Ray. I don't know. Oh, let's see. I'm going to have to edit this now. Ah, there we go. Did we stop screen sharing? Yep. Okay. So, gallery is open. Church lobby is here. Anybody got any comments or criticisms, complaints, comments? <laughs> Bring them on. I mean, what kind of fool am I? <laughs> what kind of fool am I? You should have you should have also added the music. You could have done that, right? That song, you know, like you know, played know. in the opening. Like I know it? there's a song, but I don't oh, know. There what is it. a song. It's that's the title. Song <laughs> Go look it up. Is it a Frank Sinatra song? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What kind of fool am I? <laughs> oh. That was very descriptive, and I really appreciate your revealing to me that there's uh, more than one kind of fool mentioned in the Bible, because I actually had no idea. So I've uh, learned something. I'll, I'll tell you where I first learned it. And it was a very simple little book, but it was a fun book. And it was called Kingdom Zoology. Mm. I, I don't even have the book anymore. Mm. And as I read it, this guy started talking about fools and he was equating them to animals. And yeah, and he has a bunch of other animals in there, but then that just got me going and I started. And so anyway. I, I followed the Hebrew and words. We have that book. Oh, good. <laughs> Zoology. Yeah, yeah, cool. And your teaching is getting better, Dan. The one you did before was really good, but this is, uh, you've uh, clarified it some, some more. So you're doing a great job with this. Oh, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Try my hands are up. George, mm -hmm. go for it. Thank you so much, Dan, for uh, these uh, teachings. It's it's always very um, clear and uh, insightful, and it gets me uh, thinking on many levels. Uh, first is just the realization, as Ray mentioned. Um, you know, uh, God's word is a double-edged sword, right? Um, as you hear it, the first thing is, you know, it convicts you. And the question is, what kind of fool am I? And how do I repent of it? And so it's it's really um, very convicting. And I'm like, Lord, please forgive me where I've been foolish. Um, and please correct me quickly so that I don't bring shame to your name. Um, there are a couple of questions that I have. Um, the first, which is shorter, is um, so... I had many, many years ago uh, as a kid stumbled on where Jesus says, you know, whoever calls a person a fool um, is in danger of hell or, you know, Gehenna, whatever. And um, so I, I kind of ha have held a view that never call anybody a fool because this is like red flag. But I know that many times even believers jokingly call people fools or sometimes describe people as fools. And so I'm wondering, um, in the Hebrew or whatever the term um, language is, are there different words that are used to describe fool? And um, the term that Jesus used specifically, was it a unique type of fool that he said, you know, whoever calls a person fool? you know, is at risk. So that's question number one. Uh, I don't know if I should pause for you to respond before the second question, or I should well, just mention it. Let's just respond to that one, because I, first of all, I'm not sure that I can uh, fully answer it. The way I like to think of the Hebrew is there's there's different 
behaviors that God describes with five different words that we translate as fool. So it's kind of like we use one word to describe five different behaviors. Um, so it, from God's perspective, those five different types of behaviors are the, and I put the adjective, they, they're a simple fool, an unreasonable fool, a stubborn fool. Um, so I don't know if that if that's properly answering it for you, but it's five different types of behavior. English word described as either mocking fool. Mocking is sometimes comes up as a, a whole different category, but we trans it's it, it gets blurred in your NIV, ESV, you know, it's it's just says fool, but they're they're different words in Hebrew. Now the verse that you're talking about that Jesus said, that's in the New Testament, so that would be Greek. And I'm not quite sure what that word is because I, I honestly until you mentioned it I've never taken the time to think about that so I don't know if anyone else on this call has any insight on that George but it would be something we can look into thank you so much and uh, yeah I look forward to um, hearing from anyone with insights um, okay. oh, um, oh sorry George go ahead I was going to respond to that oh sure you, you can respond because I was going to ask a second question well, it's interesting that Greek word is moros. I wonder if we get that the word moron from that, <laughs> probably um, in that instance where Jesus is talking in a hyperbolic language about, you know, if you're, you know, anybody who calls himself a fool, whatever. Um, so I'm only seeing one word. I'm not a Greek scholar, but when you click on the, when you click in the blue letter Bible on the Old Testament use for the Septuagint for that Greek word, Word, it only takes you to five scriptures in the Hebrew and they're all really random. There's a couple in Isaiah, there's one in Job. So like, you know, I mean, I have mixed feelings about the Septuagint anyway. I think it has a lot of mistakes and stuff in it. But so it would be interesting to talk to somebody like Dustin Smith, who is a Greek scholar, to learn if there are different nuances for the Greek for a fool. I would just say the Greeks, a lot of them were total fools, and they probably embodied all of those five. I don't know, <laughs> you know, in their in their crazy behavior. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, I just thought I'd share that because moros kind of sounds like it might be related to moron. Yeah, and I think George, the, it, it, part of the answer is what Suzanne said. It's the hyperbolic speech that Jesus was using at that time, and I think it's it was dealing more with the heart and intent of the person behind it when he was saying that about the person it's not just calling someone a fool now for instance in my grandson who lives with me i've raised him since he was three years old and i'll say seth you're really being a fool or that's really foolish behavior and i've used that and it said you know because i know it's not i know he's being an unreasonable fool and there's been times he's been a stubborn fool because you know and i can just go through and i know what to do you know that's how i've applied it so you had another question, George? I don't know if that we answered yeah. that. First. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I remain open to kind of just uh, get any insights on uh, that anyone might bring on that. Um, the second is, um, as you were talking about the subsequent definitions of fools um, and applying it to the church, I found, I was just pondering about the tricky way that many of these concepts can be abused uh, within Christendom. And what I mean by that is, um, I believe that every one of us who has come to, you know, a biblical monotheism uh, position, biblical Unitarian position has encountered that where as you're hearing teachings, you're asking, where is it really in the Bible? Or, you know, challenging the um, source or the interpretation and realizing that no there is fundamental error in either how scripture is being interpreted or the deceptive use of uh false traditions to substitute scriptures and typically when one brings up that you know fallacy or error um there is a pushback to like oh defer to the church authority or look the tradition of the church and all that kind of a shifting ground and there is an attempt to assuage or make one just kind of turn the other eye and just go with it and when one persists 
there is that labeling of, oh, you're a fool, you're one of those, you're divisive, oh, you're you're not listening to what we're telling you. And so getting labeled with that term and, you know, even creating a whole dossier of like, look, you're, you're, you're persisting in this way, we're telling you this, or, you know, and so you fit the description of a fool. And so it becomes like a um, really dangerous uh, way of, um labeling people who dare to stand for the truth as being fools and then kind of you know pushing those labels on them and so i'm just uh i guess more of speaking out loud on what to do or how does one counter when the church abuses um it's um uh, abuses scriptural terms to cover up for when it is the one actually in error and it has created a system where it's no, no more challenge. And so truth now becomes the outlier. And um, the boldness and courage to stand for the truth is now being relabeled as falsehood and as evil. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it I'm just does. thinking out loud. And if there's any uh, insights, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, well, primarily the way that I look at these categories is in regards to sinful behavior there's clearly times when people are going to believe something wholeheartedly 100 percent different than what we believe you know we all that's why we're all here um and they're going to misapply the use of of the discipline and the behavior you know what they should do um based on their uh their misunderstanding uh, and their um their positions and I don't know that there's anything that you can necessarily do about that concerning them. I mean, if they hold a position that Jesus is God and, and you don't, and then they want to call you a heretic and start implementing church discipline be, be, because it or behind that, it's their right to do because it's their church, but, it, but, but it, they're wrong in doing it. And I don't think there's anything else to say other than people mm -hmm. misapply this all the time, you know, so... They have, it's like having a right doesn't make you right. That's what I've always said. Mm -hmm. I may have the right to do something, but that doesn't mean I'm right in always doing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if anyone else has any insight, I welcome that, uh, whether here or later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, George. Uh, Edgardo, you're up. Uh, yes, uh, Dan, uh, it was uh, a wonderful topic that we have here. It's hard to answer the question, what kind of fool am I? <laughs> because I was reading uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, uh, when the Apostle Paul says that we are fools for Christ. <laughs> but <laughs> I... I I wrote down all the Hebrews that you've mentioned here, and they are really uh, an additional knowledge for me, and they 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 could help me understand the different pools in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But uh, regarding regarding the questions of my dear brother George, I'm reading I'm reading a commentary from my Bible. Uh, particularly verse 22. It says, you fool, uh, literally means empty-headed. Jesus suggested here that the verbal abuse stems from the same sinful motives, anger and hatred, that mm -hmm. ultimately lead to murder. And, uh, I think the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ only wants to teach his people uh, a kind of a preventive thing, you know, instead of them to uh, do something that will hurt uh, their brothers and sisters, uh, they have to prevent uh, saying words that, you know, will hurt them because it's, it's also tantamount to committing a, a murder or a kind of thing that will really uh, destroy the person. And we as kingdom people, we, we no longer do that to our brothers and sisters. In our heart, we, we do not hate them. We do not uh, try to 
do or any plan or to plan anything that will hurt them. Uh, that's that's the thing that I understand with the statement of Jesus here in in Matthew chapter five. Well, thank you, thank you, Dan, for the wonderful teaching. Uh, I I took down notes of all those so so that I can apply this. Thank you so much. I am one of the fools for Christ. <laughs> well, we'll have, let's let Donna comment, and then uh, Ray, you can probably stop the recording after that. Yeah, I just want to. Uh, I appreciate what you shared, Dan. You know, and I find this really applicable when dealing in counseling with people because if you're not aware people can really string you out and there's something called compassion fatigue is because we waste much time helping people that will you know i mean there is such a thing and it's not naughty and wrongful to use your brain in knowing who you're dealing with i'll be honest with you i've dealt with people and i'll be honest with you, they can wear you out Monday to, to Sunday, man, and you're wondering why you're all strung out after dealing with them. And I remember, I don't know if it was John Lynn or somebody, but they tapped, you know, they tapped into what I was going through and they said, "Hun, when you're dealing with people and you deal with a lot of people, got a lot of issues, it's one thing to love people. It's another thing to realize that, you know, they're steeped in their sin and they don't want your help. They're just stringing you along to get you in their drama and you're wondering why you're you know, um, got de demons dancing on your bed at night because that they're it's coming from them, you know. And he, this person wanted to really guide me in losing a lot of myself in trying to help people that just really didn't want it. They wanted my compassion, but they didn't want. They were fools. They they didn't really want anything other than. Yeah, the narcissism, you know, the, and if you don't know that and you're loving people and you're trying to counsel them and you're getting worn out, it's a real experience. Any any therapist will tell you it's called compassion fatigue where they suck the life. You, They're vampires. You, If you don't know that, you are wasting resources and time trying to help people who really are fake. And they're Christians and they're fake. And I've run into that and it stymied me for years until I started getting sick. And then I remember God, I remember going to the Lord and I heard the word, look up online what toxic relationships mean, Donna. And I'm like, Lord, are you talking to me? <laughs> well, indeed. And I looked it up and sure enough. So there's some wisdom to be brought to light in running into people within the church and you know you got to know what you're dealing with and to be able to help people so i really appreciate it dan in light of that what you shared in light of counseling and and knowing how to really meet people's needs and attributing to their um their overall depth with christ that you know they get a you know, a greater depth uh, in, in when they do receive counsel, when they do receive the reproof or the wisdom or the direction or the counsel of the Lord. Other than that, we just wear ourselves out. Yeah. Steve or Phyllis? Yeah, Dan, I'd just like to add, uh, add to that is that, you know, it's not that you're calling them a fool, but you have the the tools to understand, to see where they're coming from and what position they're in. Because so that you can, can understand what's going on about them. You know, you don't have to call them that, but you need to realize that they are that so you can deal with them on that level and deal with them correctly. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, Steve, because for me, wisdom is the ability to discern. And when you're dealing with people, you need to discern, okay, am I dealing with a simple fool here or is this an unreasonable fool? Are they in stubbornness or if they're speaking out and attacking other people and I'm seeing that, I'm able to discern. And that's what God wants. A, a, a spiritually mature person is a person who has refined their ability to discern spiritually. And that's that's how I like to think of this teaching. It, 
It helps me in dealing with others. It helps me in dealing with myself. It helps me in counseling. It helps in leadership. Uh, that's a great point, Steve. So uh, I think that we can probably stop the recording.